Good morning. Well, it's Thursday morning, the 9th of April, and greetings to colleagues from the ERRN everywhere you may be in your living rooms, kitchen tables, bedrooms, studies throughout Australia. Uh, thanks to Ju Chong as well for suggesting this presentation uh, based on an article that I published in the conversation uh, on the uh, March 27th. The presentation is basically about Parliament in a time of virus. I don't have any slides, so you're just going to have to look at me for 15 minutes and I'll be a talking head. Um, I'm currently working on a longer piece for the Australasian Parliamentary Review as well. So I think there's a lot to talk about here about uh, uh, what Parliament can and should and isn't doing during this time of crisis uh, and uh, uh, caused by the COVID-19. My basic proposition is that Parliament should continue to sit and should continue to engage uh, at the, uh, in the management of the virus response and should continue to perform all of its key representative, deliberative uh, and accountability functions, which would be uh, providing in normal times. Uh, instead, it's been adjourned. Yesterday was its second one day sitting uh, and it's been adjourned again until August. So we are currently living in an entirely parliament free zone ruled as it were, by a so-called national cabinet, which is, of course, not a cabinet at all. Uh, it has no accountability to parliament. So I think these are important considerations to address. So, I mean, uh, as I say, my basic proposition is that, um, sorry, just finding my notes here. My basic proposition is that the response to the COVID-19 pandemic uh, in Australia uh, in this period, March, April, 2020, has seen an unprecedented expansion of the authority of executive government at the expense of parliament. Three major factors uh, to justify that statement. First of all, the national capital, which uh, the national cabinet, which consists of the first ministers of the Commonwealth states and territories. It's assumed a central role directing the national response to the virus supported by its set of advisory bodies and of course operates without accountability. Second, the governments have activated their emergency powers to impose residential lockdowns, business closures, radical restrictions on public assembly and the movement of individuals. Uh, and third, and, and I guess the principal focus of what I'm going to talk about now is the House of Representatives uh, was recalled for one one day sitting and uh, now a second one day sitting of an unrepresentative quorum of members to approve the stimulus packages. And then over the protest of opposition parties has been adjourned for 20 weeks. In New South Wales, the parliament's been adjourned for a longer period of time. Local government elections uh, have been uh, postponed. So taken together, I think it's pretty clear these measures substantially limit the capacity of parliament to undertake its core roles of representation, authorization, deliberation and scrutiny. It's very interesting to see how the parliament and the public responded to these restrictions on parliament. Amid the progressively tighter lockdown rules, the parliamentary restrictions were officially represented as appropriate further institutional adjustments to the demands of the declared emergency. And more alarmingly, they were largely accepted as such. There were critical voices, and we'll come to those, but they didn't, these measures did not attract the outright condemnation that would have been voiced in quote unquote normal pre virus conditions. Uh, and indeed, by its own behaviour, too, Parliament showed that it, along with the rest of society, could adjust to the, nor the new normal. So, you know, I think this raises some very important, uh, some even existential questions about the role of Australia's long standing parliamentary uh, democracy, its system of representative democracy. What are the fundamental standards that we expect 
of a representative democracy in a time of crisis? Can Parliament contribute to the management and resolution of crisis? I believe it can. Uh, or must it simply suspend critical judgment to allow the executive to, uh, as it were, get on with the job, the urgent job of managing and responding to the crisis? Has the widely reported democratic malaise spread so deep into the fibre of Australian public uh, opinion and elite opinion that we are actually prepared to do without Parliament uh, entirely for long periods of time? And so on the spectrum of kind of essential services like a supermarket, Parliament is, it seems to me, down the other end of the spectrum as a non-essential service. Uh, well, a lot of praise has been heaped on Parliament for the alacrity with which it passed uh, these stimulus packages, uh, first of all, in its one day sitting on March the 23rd uh, and in yesterday's uh, setting. 189 billion uh, of uh, support approved in the first session, 130 billion approved yesterday, uh, and uh, all done in a spirit of um, uh, amity, courtesy, uh, reasoned debate. But the basic problem with this parliament was not in its the speed of its response and the effective way that it supported the government's legislative package. The big problem with the parliament was that it was deeply unrepresentative. Uh, this was achieved basically by a deal between the two major parties. So when the uh, speaker took the chair uh, on the morning of Monday, the 23rd of March. The first thing he said was to acknowledge the changed seating arrangements. And he said, I'm very conscious of the need to limit the total number of people in the chamber at any one time, which is of course an implied reference to the social distancing rules. Uh, but he failed to mention, the speaker failed to mention that achieving that level of separation in the chamber was possible only because nearly half the house was not in attendance. And that in turn had come about through some conversations between him, the Speaker, between the Leader of the House, the Attorney General, Christian Porter, uh, and the Manager of Opposition Business, Tony Burke, who'd basically negotiated a drastic reduction in attendance. Uh, what happened was that uh, through really unprecedented use of pairing arrangements, 30 Coalition MPs and 30 Labor MPs were told by their party uh, not to attend the sitting. Uh, so what that meant was, uh, along with the single Green MP and three of the five independents who did choose to attend, there were only 88 MPs, that is including the Speaker, in the Parliament uh, attending the session approving the stimulus package. Just 58% of the total of 151. So it's a quorum. Uh, it protected the government's narrow majority. You'd think everybody's a winner, but the uh, the rump parliament, and I think that's a fair term to call, the rump parliament um, was grossly unrepresentative. Those 60 MPs who were missing represent roughly 6 million voters. And the only explanation offered was uh, social distancing. So... The, those who were present in the parliament were actually quite unrepresentative of the parliament as a whole. Uh, given that most ministers were there, that means the backbench as a whole was relatively underrepresented. Women were relatively underrepresented. Only about a fifth of those present in the chamber at the time on that Monday, the 23rd of March, were women. Uh, none of the five Tasmanian MPs were present. Uh, Western Australians, only two ministers and two backbenchers out of 14, uh, made the journey across the Nullarbor. Uh, neither of the Indigenous members of the House were present on that March the 23rd. So I think this is a high price to pay for Parliament um, for social distancing in terms of representation. Uh, and of course, there was uh, urgency and it did pass those bills very quickly. But uh, all the more surprising and I think damaging then. Uh, at the end of that day of March 23rd was uh, Christian Porter, the Attorney General and Leader of the House, uh, dropped on Parliament a revised sitting calendar. It's not entirely clear if this was a surprise. Uh, 
Okay, I actually just paused the recording then because uh, of the rain shower that just came through. I'm sitting uh, in a cottage in uh, Boomagiri on the far south coast of New South Wales and we've gone from bushfires over summer to now some absolutely gorgeous rain. I'll just have to speak up uh, over the sound of, uh, the wonderful sound of rain on a tin roof. Now, I was just getting stuck into Christian Porter for uh, his changed uh, sitting calendar. And his, I, I have to say, I, I think his comments or the way the government announced this was pretty shabby. Uh, I think it should have been announced basically by the Prime Minister, but it was announced by the Leader of the House. He made a short speech. It's a model of ambiguity. Um, he basically said because the government's decided uh, that it can't predict the economy with any certainty, uh, so it has decided to delay the May budget until October. We knew that. Uh, and he said, moreover, Parliament's just passed supply bills to cover the period ahead. Uh, and then he said also something else has played into the government's mind, uh, and that is the risk that attaches to flying in members from every corner of Australia uh, during the peak uh, point of transmission in the coronavirus. Uh, and so again, social distancing was being used to justify the unrepresentative membership of a rump parliament. Uh, and now it's being used to rationalize the long-term adjournment of parliament itself. And in this speech, he did not spell out the implications. He, he basically said the government saw no need for the 18 sitting days that had been scheduled for the May and June session. Parliament would not be recalled until the 11th of August. He didn't provide those dates. Now, I know Anne Toomey has commented this is, uh, we are typically going into a winter recess. This is a lot longer than a winter recess. As I say, 18 sitting days in May and June uh, have been canceled. And so really, uh, despite uh, opposition from Labor, the Greens and one of the independents, that new calendar was approved. And in effect, as I said at the outset, government in Australia for the next 20 weeks, it seems, is to be a parliament-free zone. The executive is setting out to govern alone and it's been resourced with the approval of supply and it's equipped with its draconian emergency powers uh, and it's all been um, managed through this extraordinary national cabinet. And just a quick word about the national cabinet. Of course, uh, this is a misnomer. It is not a cabinet. It is uh, an extended form of the COAG arrangements uh, and in fact emerged from a COAG meeting that was held on the 13th of March out at Parramatta. I highly recommend Catherine Murphy's descript um, uh, report of this meeting uh, published in The Guardian um, just on the 4th of April, very detailed kind of blow-by-blow -blow account of uh, what happened. Now, cabinets are accountable to parliaments. Cabinets consist of cabinet ministers who are all uh, members of their own parliament and thus individually and collectively accountable to parliament. The so-called national cabinet is not accountable to any parliament uh, beyond the individual accountability of each of the government leaders to their separate parliaments. It's not collectively accountable to any parliament. Cabinet decisions, of course, are routinely exposed to debate and scrutiny by parliament. Decisions of the national cabinet are not debated in any parliament. They're simply announced at a media conference. Uh, and of course, there's no such thing as cabinet collective responsibility. Now, I, I certainly acknowledge the national cabinet has proven to be an effective coordination mechanism across the Federation, uh, but it's less an innovation than an extension of COAG and its rapid transformation into a supreme decision-making body and its continued operation without accountability to any parliament are contrary to the principles of representative democracy. So, I mean, I think we're in a, uh, on paper, a serious situation.
Now, the media made a lot of reports at the time of the lengthy adjournment to Parliament having sat without interruption through the Spanish flu epidemic, through the Depression and through two world wars. And that's true. In 1941, uh, the House of Representatives even successfully changed the government itself through a vote of no confidence. Uh, and that took place without noticeable disruption of the war effort. More recently, however, parliamentary adjournments have become a more routine feature of executive political management. And so I say that if this is a modern day crisis for parliament, then it's a crisis that's got slightly deeper roots than the immediate COVID-19 context. Indeed, parliamentary adjournments, emergency executive powers, and extended ministerial authority have become somewhat more familiar features of the Australian system of government over recent years. During the Section 44 eligibility crisis, uh, we saw the parliamentary candidate frequently altered, uh, well, occasionally altered, so as to avoid sessions when ele ineligible government members of the House were awaiting by-elections, and i.e. the government's one-seat majority was potentially at risk. Uh, moreover, Parliament was hastily adjourned in August 2018, as numbers were counted in the Liberal Party room for a leadership challenge against Malcolm Turnbull. Uh, and in the opening days of the newly installed Morrison government, in the lead up to the May 2019 federal election, uh, we saw substantial, substantial reduction of sitting days. There were just 10 sitting days of the House. And now each of these measures was let's be honest, designed to suit the political convenience of the government, either to protect its majority or to forestall uh, the political inconvenience of question times and urgency debates and all of those petty fogging parliamentary, you know, uh, accountability procedures that in fact at times of crisis we indeed value so highly. So parliamentary suspension uh, is, uh, has become a feature. Equally, the dramatic expansions of ministerial powers granted under the pandemic emergency have very close parallels in the emergency declarations during the bushfire crisis just back in December and January. Uh, those emergency declarations empowered state agency to enforce evacuations, road closures, uh, and a tourist-free zone covering 14,000 square kilometres. So, I mean, it does seem as though the Australian default response to crisis uh, is, unlike 1941, uh, is to vest the executive uh, and in turn the uniformed state agencies, not elected representatives, uh, with the ultimate responsibility to resolve the crisis. Uh, and this involves coercion, as we have seen. And all of this is taking place against the backdrop of rising public cynicism, um, declining trust, um, dissatisfaction with democracy. So maybe it is the case that um, parliament is a non-essential service. Now, of course, the textbook role of parliamentary democracy sees parliament serving five complementary democratic values. Uh, and none of these at present are being fully observed in this crisis. Parliament does, as I say, five things. It provides a vehicle for the interests and preferences of individual voters to be represented in aggregate decision-making. That's the representation function. There's the authorization function, namely it provides the ultimate source of authority for legislative measures. There's the deliberative function. Parliaments are an assembly for advocacy, for debate, for consideration of contemporary issues. It provides the executive legitimacy function. Basically, it provides the means by which governments can be made and broken. Uh, and importantly, it provides the accountability function, scrutinizing executive actions. I think all of these have been uh, somewhat set back by the current role. So let's just look at these uh, in a little more detail. So in a sense, the accountability function 
has in fact been performed. There have been two sessions of Parliament at which uh, the executive's proposals for uh, economic stimulus and safety nets have been approved uh, speedily. Um, so in a sense, tick done. The uh, scrutiny is still uh, greatly lacking. So uh, my preference, uh, my strong belief is that Parliament should continue to sit. Um, I guess for scrutiny, all we've got to go on now is as a result of yesterday's session, the creation of a Senate Select Committee uh, chaired by the opposition, chaired by an opposition senator, um, uh, which will uh, continue a Select Committee uh, with its uh, status and uh, some powers will be able to provide some oversight of what the government is doing to implement its um, uh, its emergency packages. So uh, there's also a committee called the Delegated Legislation Committee in the Senate, which has uh, said that it will have a role in monitoring some of the uh, legislative performances of the Senate. Uh, the Senate Select Committee, of course, is modelled on the New Zealand. Uh, we seem to be copying so much from New Zealand uh, that's worthwhile. The New Zealand model of a, of a select uh, committee, which was called for here by a panel of judges. And, and so uh, we, we've got a scrutiny mechanism uh, and it's not um, uh, perfect, but it is better than, than nothing. What's really missing are the deliberative and representative functions uh, of the House of Rep Representatives. Deliberation. I, I strongly believe that Parliament should be sitting to not just tick off the executive's proposals for uh, uh, the next stimulus package, but should actively be engaged in debating the big picture, the, uh, the strategic problems that we're facing in this crisis. Uh, with my conversation piece, I began by quoting, uh, by quoting a flaw, quoting an architectural feature of the Victorian State Parliament, uh, which has set into the tiles back in the 1890s, this um, Old Testament quote, which is, um, uh, uh, where no council is, the people fall, uh, but with a multitude of councillors, the uh, the uh, people are safe. So a multitude of council. It's a lovely sentiment to have uh, portrayed in the uh, uh, entrance to a parliament. We need the multitude of councillors to be involved in debating uh, not just the uh, and, and approving not just the legislative package, but the a whole uh, strategic dilemma that we face here as a nation amongst many coping with this COVID-19 pandemic. I really want to see a strategic debate and I think Parliament is capable of a strategic debate. Parliament debated strategy in the First and Second World War. I'm not saying that this is going to be at the expense of the executive final decision making, but uh, do we really believe that um, the National Cabinet is the sole source of uh, wisdom for uh, working out um, the, for example, flattening the curve. For how long will we flatten the curve? What is the tolerance of people for the long-term duration of this lockdown? Um, what will uh, the process of uh, lifting the restrictions look like? Uh, and how will we find our way through? So I think there's a real deliberative uh, function that Parliament can and should provide. Finally, representation. I've said that these rump parliaments are unrepresentative, and I think that is a disgrace, and I think we'll look back on it and say, how was that allowed? I want to see parliament convened in total uh, and performing its representative functions. Um, you know, we just do not know. We're, we're in totally uncharted waters here. Um, we're still learning how to cope with this pandemic, and grappling to comprehend some of these immense social and cultural and economic costs that we're paying uh, with this lockdown. It's essential that Parliament play a representative role. I mean, the beauty of having an organisation which is structured on these electorate uh, structures is that members from around the nation can bring national attention, however 
fleetingly and imperfectly, can bring national attention uh, to their local issues and insights and judgments. Um, not all parts of Australia will experience this pandemic in the same way. So local stories are not dispensable. Local stories are an essential part of understanding the, uh, the way through. They're vital, both the stories of hardship uh, and of resilience. So the local heroes uh, and the, the people who are doing it tough. There's going to be a lot of trauma. There's going to be a lot of uh, joblessness, isolation and trauma, uh, as well as the health impact of this virus. And I think multitudes of councillors, to quote that um, uh, uh, flaw in the Victorian Parliament, the multitude of councillors with many stories to tell, uh, that's their job. And I want to hear those voices and we can't hear the voices at present when Parliament has been adjourned. So in summary, uh, and thank you for your patience, I, I, uh, there's a lot more to be said on this and I think we've got a long way to uh, go before all of these issues are adequately understood, let alone addressed. But my basic proposition is this, uh, I think we are in something of a crisis of parliamentary democracy. I think COVID-19 has brought to the surface some trends which have been building up in our politics over recent years, perhaps decades, but certainly the recent decade. Uh, and I think we're now in a, without parliament for 20 weeks, we are in uncharted waters. My concern is that in dealing with the twin crises in the realms of public health and economic management, uh, that governments have exacerbated a third crisis, a less widely acknowledged crisis in the sphere of governance. So in other words, we're combating pandemic and recession by surrendering key features of Australia's system of parliamentary democracy. So let me leave it there. Good luck to you all. Thanks for your attention. Stay well. Stay classy.